So to close out our spring summit this afternoon, we are going to hear the point of view of luxury retailer Saks Fifth Avenue and learn how they are preparing for the next normal, or uh, as one of our speakers said earlier, the, the weird normal. Uh, but we're really excited to have CMO Emily Esner join us. She'll be talking to Joe Manoff, who's been the editor-in-chief of Glossy since 2016. Um, many of you know Glossy. It covers uh, how the fashion and beauty industries are approaching digital with sophistication, depth, and honesty. Uh, Jill and Emily, welcome to the Commerce Next virtual stage. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. And hey, Emily, so glad to hey. see you. Good to see you. Yeah, for the uh, let's do a little brief intro. So Emily Esner, a CMO of Saks Fifth Avenue, you've had a good <laughs> a good run at Saks and Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, so walk walk us through it really quickly. Um, your current yeah. role as viewer. Sure. Yeah, I've been I've been at Saks actually for a, for a number of years. Um, but I've I've led the marketing function for for a few of those. Um, and as you said, it certainly has been a, a super interesting run. Um, uh, you know, I think most recently, of course, we announced the spin out of our digital business just a couple months ago. Um, so a whole new and exciting challenge um, ahead of us. But it's been it's been really, really exciting. Right on. Are people shopping? What's the behavior and activity going on right now? Yeah, I mean, I will say and, and, you know, I think one of the interesting stories of the pandemic, certainly, at least for us, has been that you know consumer spending largely was very strong um, within within you know within our world, um, and I think that was both you know existing customers as well as you know, we had a pretty meaningful influx of new customers, um, and so I think what we're seeing now, which is which is exciting, is we're seeing we're seeing still that behavior and still certainly a you know meaningful increase in new customers, but we're also starting to see, you know, some real signs of economic optimism. So, and I think that's coming from, you know, people feeling like the virus is, you know, in obviously we're in you know, better shape, um, feeling like the vaccine rollout is well underway. And, and as that, I think, makes its way across communities and populations, people feel more comfortable. And so we, we are beginning to see some elements of that pent up demand that we always sort of thought, you know, would come they were beginning to feel the beginning stages of that. And so we're actually seeing a shift in product categories that consumers are buying. And so we had seen, um, you know, we'd seen a lot of strength in beauty. We had seen a lot of strength in home, a small business, but we'd really seen, you know, really meaningful increases there, um, a really significant strength in men's, you know, really throughout the pandemic. And what we're starting to see now is women's ready to wear is coming back. And what we think that means is, you know, it's a couple of things. One, I think it means that a lot of those events and occasions, whether it's, you know, big events, weddings, um, that sort of thing, those are coming back. Um, but also smaller scale, I'm going out to eat. I'm going to be dining indoors. Um, and I look at my closet and I say, wow, I really don't have anything to wear. I um, haven't even thought about doing this for a year. And so that's, I think, creating a lot of need for consumers as well as the reality of offices opening back up. Um, you know, there's been some announcements um, even today here in New York City of you know, major employers bringing their, um, bringing their employees back. And that has meant that you know, consumers are coming back and they're, set, they're again looking at their closets and saying, I don't have anything to wear to the office. I've spent the last year you know, in yoga pants um, or a sweatshirt or what have you. Now what, I'm gonna, what am I going to wear? I'm really feeling the need to update. Yes. Well, it's optimistic. There's some revenge shopping indeed happening. Yeah, <laughs> and absolutely. good to know that there's life beyond beyond the sweatpants. Uh, how is this impacting your marketing? Um, how are you are you leaning into going out, the idea of going out and going to restaurants or maybe even traveling? It's a you know, it's a great question. And and you would think the answer to that question was, well, yes, of course, absolutely. We're so excited about it. Um, but I think if we've learned anything from the pandemic, it's probably that it is not it's not monolithic. It didn't. It didn't happen monolithically. It didn't touch, you know, every community in the same way. Certainly not every person in the same way. And so even today, um, I think there's a pretty wide range of feelings around where we are in the pandemic. Some people who are incredibly excited uh, to be able to get out there, and some people who are nervous. I think our, you know, our customers who have loved ones in India are in a very different headspace. And so I think we have to treat it actually very carefully. I think it is about optimism. I think it is about the joy of reconnecting. And I think as much as we can lean into messages that feel very universal, I think the better off we're going to be. It's also an opportunity for us to really lean into personalization, really, you know, it's a very core strategy for us 
Um, and really, you know, we've been really trying to mine our data for signals, not just of purchase behavior, but also of you know, sort of mindset behavioral, um, so that we're better able to target where we are, you know, where we are communicating with our customers and certainly the message that we're communicating. Are you able to, I guess, make a plan and say, um, you know, this is our marketing plan for the year. Is it maybe in phases? In six months, we'll feel comfortable to talk about about going out or TBD. Yeah, I, I think it's it's one that we handle in pieces. Absolutely, I think and and you know most of our spend at this point is in digital, which gives us some flexibility, of course, in terms of you know testing of message. Um, but I think the days you know we haven't run a you know an annual marketing plan for a number of years at this point. I think those days those days were gone pre pandemic, but they're certainly completely gone now. Um, for us, it is really, you know, we are driven more by, you know, what are our shoot schedules, those sort of things that are, you know, those, you know, very logistical kind of considerations, but otherwise we want to be as close to, um, you know, as close to when an event is happening as possible before making a decision. And of course, we really, we really do want to iterate on that message and of course on, on the medium or, you know, the, the targeting associated with it. How did this impact your role, your job, your marketing strategy overall for SACS? Yeah, it's, su it's super exciting. It really is. Um, you know, I think we, as you said, you know, we've we've spun spun the digital business out, um, and one of the core, you know, sort of theses around growth for the digital business in particular was actually doubling down on our marketing investment. Um, so it's been a really fun time, and I think we, you know, we asserted that as a as a growth lever because of the you know relatively strong performance that we have been able to drive. Um, as well as the headroom that we, you know, that we really see in the market, both of course in the media market, but you know more broadly, again, you know, in the luxury e-commerce space. Um, and so it's been a really exciting couple of months. I've been really proud of of the team and how we've been able, really able to lean into some new tactics. So you know, we've leaned, you know, no surprise, we're very focused on acquiring new customers and really trying to do that at scale. So we've um, leaned in, you know, significantly into prospecting for paid social and display, more paid search, um, but really testing a lot of a lot of new tactics there, um, some new bidding strategies. Um, and largely we've been able to find that our um, that our returns have largely held up. So it's very exciting. Um, still very, very early days and there's a lot of new um, you know new channels that we're going to be getting into, a lot more video, um, we're going to be launching our first podcast advertising. So um, in some ways, very early days, but we're really, really enthusiastic about uh, the returns we've been able to drive, the response we've been able to drive, and, and we just think there's, there's so much more. Yeah, yeah. Your digital marketing, I guess, okay. strategy uh, spend as as everything as everything moved digital. I guess how would you say that that strategy compares prior? It seems like it's more robust, more involved. Uh, how would you describe, yeah, the current focus compared to pre-pandemic? Yeah, you know, versus pre-pandemic, I don't think probably if I were to look at the split of digital versus versus print or traditional, it's probably not meaningfully different. You know, I think we we pulled back, I think maybe a little bit in outdoor during the pandemic. Um, but largely, you know, we, as of a few years ago, probably the vast majority of our spend was in digital. And, and it was in digital because, um, I mean, it's, it's a few reasons. One, the, the targeting capabilities there are the best that we're going to get. And for us, targeting is very, very important because, you know, we're looking for specific consumers who are interested in our brands. Um, and, and so being able to do that and do that precisely is very, very important. Um, it, of course, is where the audience is. And certainly that was the case over the last year uh, where we saw that you know, availability of media was, was certainly up and also just you know, consumption of digital media was very much up. Um, and also it's a place of a lot of innovation. You can run something, you can test it, you can iterate, you can run three versions um, or more. And, and so that for us, when we think about this idea of we want to be, you know, as close to the consumer as possible and being able to respond as quickly as possible is very, very important. All of that said, you know, we continue to run in magazines, we continue to run in newspapers, we continue to run outdoor. Um, and that um, for us, we feel like we are at the right level of investment there, um, but continues to be very important. And certainly from a 
you know, top of funnel strategy, we, we continue to stand by and we continue to think there's opportunities there. Yeah. As yeah. you're trying some new things, what's been your, I guess, strategy for, for going there? Are you able to test things for a duration? Is it to, I mean, do you kind of go all in? It's, it's very trial and error lately. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't call it trial and error. I think we, we have a, you know, a pretty robust testing capability and sort of testing ethos among our teams. And so at any given time, we're running, you know, call it a dozen different tests. Um, and it can be everything from, we, I think we recently ran something um, with a remarketing partner that was around specifically actually around messaging of an offer or rather an item that had a special offer associated with it versus, you know, messaging that special offer. And what we found, probably not surprising in retrospect, but what we found is that messaging that special offer significantly improved click-through rates, for example. Um, yeah. We also ran a, um, a test with, with a paid search partner around how we were bidding. So we previously had been bidding in this one, you know, relatively specific category um, for the lowest cost. We switched that to bidding for the highest value customer that was meaningfully meaningfully better. And so we switched that campaign. Um, and so I think, again, we continue to um, you know, try to run a pretty structured testing program um, and methodically you know, addressing opportunities while you know, obviously wanting to be as flexible as we can. Yeah. yeah. Is it, would you say there's a ripple effect, I guess, across your marketing mix? If you find that maybe a certain language resonates uh, by, with through a digital ad, will that carry through, I guess, across the board? I'm sure it's pretty consistent anyway, but um, how would you describe that? Yeah, no, ab absolutely. You know, in general, um, and messaging is something, especially over the last year, but messaging is something that we spend a fair bit of time thinking through because of the implications on the brand and, you know, and just how closely we hold the brand. Um, those are things we think we think very carefully about. Um, but absolutely, we will find that if there's an insight, um, which can be, you know, akin to that remarketing insight, or it can be, um, or it can be something that's a little bit more creative. Yes, absolutely. We will, we will take that. And then to everything that we can possibly address, we will then try to address it. I think you want to be thoughtful about that and say, are there reasons why what we learned in you know, that test might or might not apply in another medium? But in general, yes, we want to be very agile in how we apply learning. Uh, as there's been more, I guess, buzz, some more noise online and everybody is getting comfortable with shopping online, I guess, uh, more marketplaces popping up. But yeah, how are you, how are you able to retain that customer? Yeah, you know, customer retention is, of course, a, a huge focus of ours. I mean, I'll just point to, to a, a couple, a couple new things that we have going on that I think that we're really excited about. One is we have, um, we have a digital stylist program that we're really leaning into and we're really investing into. When you think about, um, you know, there's so many wonderful things about shopping online. You have this incredible assortment. You have amazing product information. You can do it at any time. Um, so it has tons of advantages. But I think sometimes, especially for um, for a company like ours, it can be a little bit overwhelming. And so being able to be paired with a real live human digital stylist uh, who is able to help you, you know, get whatever you're looking for, or help you really, you know, express your identity um, in the way that you think is best really fabulous. And so um, anybody can access um, our digital stylist. They're free um, and they're happy to work on, you know, anything, whether it's finding a specific pro specific item to helping me get ready for a specific event to I want to refresh my whole wardrobe because I'm going back to the office. Um, anything in between, they are fantastic at that. Um, we also recently um, expanded our, our Limitless program. And so our Limitless program is for our very best customers. Um, previously, it was very robust in store. We recently expanded that to our very best digital customers. Um, and so these customers get access to a host of uh, services um, and opportunities, especially, you know, really money can't buy experiences. And so we're really excited to be able to, you know, extend this offering to a broader set of customers. And then also, I think a little bit more broadly, it's a little bit acquisition, it's a little bit retention, um, but we recently introduced free shipping and free returns without yeah. code every day. Um, and, and there's, there's more customer experience enhancements to come. 
Yeah, well, that was my next question about acquiring customers uh, and making them hip to all these uh, bells and whistles that are awesome that you've recently added. Um, anything that really stands out in your mind um, in terms of what's working now? Uh, if you had to name one to three things. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of the, you know, the digital media tactics that I talked through, certainly, you're, you know, the paid social, um, paid search, display. But beyond the world of media, I think for a company like ours, we are looking for what I call sort of programmatic ways of acquiring customers. So we have had a relationship for a number of years with American Express, with their Platinum and Centurion card members, um, a really multifaceted relationship, but it's centered around a statement credit. So you shop at Saks and, and you'll get a, a certain amount off, depending on if you're a Centurion or Platinum card member. Um, and that, um, for us, has has been a source of um, certainly a source of meaningful customer acquisition. And so we are really looking to build this space. So looking for other, um, other potential partners who have um, you know, really wonderful customer bases, how can we offer them value um, and then you know, introduce them to the world of SACS? Right on. Yeah. Well Purpose-driven brands, I mean, really resonating. We're hearing a lot about uh, vocalizing your values, connect uh, customers looking for brands and retailers that connect with their values. What's your strategy around that right now? Absolutely. it's you, We think about it actually from a place of, of our brand being... Um, being very much known as influential and our brand being influential, I think maybe maybe more importantly. Um, and so I think a lot of brands talk about having platforms and you know all brands sort of inherently do have platforms. I think for us, what makes us different is the influence of our brand and the influence of our platform. And so we actually take it, we take it very seriously and we actually think of it as a responsibility that because we have this platform and because we have this influence, we then have the responsibility to advance issues that are important to our customers, to our associates, to our communities. Um, one example of this, actually a number of years ago at this point, um, was when we decided to really stand for mental health. Um, and we said, you know what, this is an issue. At that point, it wasn't an issue that was discussed, um, at the, certainly not at the level or the frequency that it's being discussed today, which is so gratifying. Um, but we said, this is really important. It's impacting our communities. Um, and we know that we can make a difference here. We know that our voice will matter. Um, and we create, actually created SAC, our foundation, the SACS Foundation, and really centered that around um, making mental health and mental wellness wellness rather, a priority in every community. Um, this month, of course, is actually Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, and we have a multifaceted campaign going. You can go to sax.com and um, get mental health tips. Same thing um, on, our, on our Instagram. That's awesome. Uh, as things again fluctuate and with looking back at the year, does marketing spend, should it fluctuate? Should you pull back at certain times? Uh, is that a bad idea? What's your take on that? You know, I think um, you know, I think when I look at last year, for example, and I know a lot of a lot of brands and a lot of companies, you know, really did pull back. We were pretty we were pretty consistent and we were pretty committed. And when I look back at that, you know, in retrospect, and those are those are scary decisions to make, and those are scary, you know, sort of no, don't don't cut my marketing. I'm, we're gonna we're gonna deliver. Um, but when I look back on that, I think that was very much the right decision. We were able to drive you know, meaningful increases in new customers. And it really was because we were able to be consistent with our full funnel strategy. Um, and also I think, you know, we had just fantastic opportunities um, because other companies did pull back. So I think in general, I, I do think, you know, investing in good times and in bad, is gonna be better than the alternative. Right on. Right on. Note to end it on. Emily, this was a great conversation. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Wonderful to see you. Thank you. Yeah.